I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God is good, and all the time, good afternoon, everyone, good evening, all right, how are you, how was your day, oh, I'm fine, thanks, how was your day, did you work hard on the job, all right, hard work is Christian behavior, overwork is not, are you following me, hard work. The Bible says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Hard work is Christian behavior. And there's no harder work than the work of salvation of souls. And God does it seven days a week. Well, I'm glad to see you. I thank God for sparing your lives and mine and making it possible for, come, for us to come to this house of worship to worship him. I'm grateful to see quite a number of men. I like to see men in church. I read a statistic many, many years ago. I actually read it. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is a child, there is a 14% 14 chance the entire family will follow. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is the wife or the mother, there is a 23% chance the entire family will follow. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is the man, there is a 96% chance the whole family will follow. I read that research many years ago. Now God knew what he was doing when he put Adam as the head of the family. He knew what he was doing. Many years ago, the pastor of my church told me, when you preach, Try to reach the men. If you reach the men, the women will follow. And so I'm always pleased to see men in church. Church is not considered something strong to do. The way we determine strength in this society. Ah, church is for sissies. No, church is not for sissies. Unless you call Jesus a sissy. And anyone who can create the universe by his word cannot be a sissy. There are too many. If some of us would be a little sissyish, we wouldn't end up in behind bars. Are you following me? A little meek, a little humble, that is strength. Humility is strength. Turning the other cheek is strength. Reflexive behavior isn't strength. You don't have to think to react. You have to think to respond. Men, God bless you. And if there's any man listening online, God bless you. 80% of membership in the average Christian church in the United States is made up of women. And God bless all women, don't misunderstand me. But I love to see strong men in church. Is there anyone with us today, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist? Raise your hand. Ah, one strong man. All right. What's your name? John. That's a good Bible name. Amen. Yes. He wrote three, five, uh, five books of the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and what's the last one? Revelation. You have a good name. John, thanks for coming. May God bless your life. Give your wife who can cook. Can you say amen? Bless your studies. <laughs> Make an example to other men. Anyone else? Who invited you, John? My oh, your girlfriend is a nice person. <laughs> I like her too. Sister girlfriend, what's your name? Peter. P-E-Y-T-O-N. Ah, Sister Peyton. Thanks for bringing John. Bring him back. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Not a Seventh-day Adventist. 
Well, you know, teenagers are shy people. So we won't bother her, but tell, her, tell us her name since she won't tell us. This is my name, Diana. Diana. And my name is Victoria. Diana and Victoria, good names. Diana, Victoria, thank you very much for coming. And of course, Dr. John. Anybody else? Ah, here's a brother back there in white t-shirt. White is the color of righteousness. You're nicely dressed. What's his name? Oh, Isaiah. Oh. Isaiah, do you know you wrote a book of the Bible? 66 chapters, Isaiah. Good to see you. Are you in school? What grade? Tenth. Eighth. All right. God bless your studies. Are you in school, John? Okay. What about Diana? And uh, my other sister is? Victoria. Are you in school? God bless your studies. Do well. Do well. God gave you that good mind that you have. Say amen for our guests. Amen. That was a little lifeless. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. One more time. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? Uh, God wants people to tell him I love you. you now people like to be told I love you. God loves to hear it. God is a God who talks. He wrote the commandments, he wrote the commandments, and he also spoke them. Jesus came and spoke and spoke and spoke. God loves to talk. So he loves to hear us talk to him and tell him that we love him. Our subject for today, life before the pandemic. What did I say? Before I get any further, please remember my requests. Wherever you are, preserve reverence as if you're in a courtroom and the judge is God. The same reverence we give to human judges, let's give more of that to the judge of all the earth. Can you say amen? So if you're not using one of these as a, as a Bible, please make sure it does not ring. And as I tend to do, let me make sure mine is off. So you don't say that man is a well-dressed hypocrite. All right. Mine's off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. My words cannot save you. The words of God will change your lives. And so simply say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Isaiah 1 18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God is a reasonable God. Many times when I was a child, I found my parents very unreasonable. Just because they did not let me do what I wanted to do, they were unreasonable. God is a reasonable God. Can you say amen? He's a reasonable father. And so he says to us, come now, let us reason together. I'll listen to you, says God. And when I finished, please, I want you to listen to me. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your continuing love. We thank you, Father, for your elastic arms that stretch all around the universe. But for the purpose of this service, Father, around this world, and to be more precise, around this church. As we bow in your presence, if we've offended you today, forgive us. Fill us with the hatred for sin. Give us a love for what's right, just because it's right. Father, grant us your spirit. He is the spirit of truth. Let us not trust our intellects, but trust the spirit to guide us as we think. Bless our visitors, dear God. We're grateful to have them. Diana, Victoria, John, and Isaiah. Touch their lives in a very, very special way. And remind them from time to time, they're also young people in the Bible who were upright and strong for you. Bless their families, I pray. Now, God, put your words in my mouth. Let me be conscious that every second I am in this desk for your glory, not for mine. And Father, if anyone listening to me has contracted the coronavirus, I ask you again, in the name of the merciful Jesus, and because you yourself are merciful, 
heal that person, dear God, 100%. I offer this prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? Life before the pandemic. It is now 20 after 6. I'll release you by 7. I'll try. Genesis 1. Let's read verse 1. Don't go there. Just say it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created everything everywhere. The only thing God did not create is sin. So keep this in mind. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Listen to Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them, everything in the heavens, whether they're stars, planets, asteroids, angels, whatever, everything in the heavens was made by God. And so the Bible says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. It's difficult for us to comprehend that because our word has no power. How many times have we said, I will do this, I will do that, and we never do? And we mean it when we say it. That cannot happen to God. Verse 9, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. And so Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then from that point all the way down, we have all that was done on each day. What was made on day one? What was made on day one? Light, day two. The firmament, day three. What? Dry land separated from the water and vegetation. Day four. Sun, moon, and stars, day five. Fish and birds, day six. Land animals and humanity. Now, listen to God as he summarizes all that he had done. Genesis 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But something happened. Something went wrong. Something called sin entered the garden and the world that God had made. And by the way, the heavens and the earth, sin contaminated both. Sin entered this world not through God, but through humanity. Keep this in mind when you're tempted to blame God for hurricanes and floods and avalanches and COVID-19. If you go back to creation, God made a perfect world and put two perfect people in it. Then he told them, if you do what I say, this perfect life will continue forever. That's effectively what he said when he told him, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, or in the day thou disobeyest thereof, finish it for me, thou shalt surely die. God told our first parents, if you disobey me, you will die. Now, all God said was, thou shalt surely die. He did not say, roses shall bring forth thorns, but the Bible says they did. Are you following me? He did not say that women will have painful childbirth, but that was part of the curse on the woman. He did not say that hard work would result, but that happened in the sweat of thy face. Thou shalt eat bread. He did not say the ground would become difficult to cultivate, but that happened. In other words, that all of that is an expression of a dying world. And we brought it. Come on, finish my word. On ourselves. God is not to be blamed. I can't tell you how many times I've met people who said, I, I prayed for this, God didn't do it, I'm leaving God. I'm still waiting to meet someone who will say, I got sick, I'm leaving the devil. People always leave God. Nobody leaves the devil. Do yourself a favor and leave the devil, not God. Are you with me? All right. So God made a perfect world, perfect people. They sinned, messed up, and the whole 
creation was messed up. Animals became wild. The first brother, first person, first child on earth killed his brother. Several generations later, a woman tempted her husband, told her husband, go commit adultery because I want a child and I can't have. Have a child with that woman. That's Sarah and Abraham. A couple generations later, a wife told her son, her younger son, let's get together and deceive your father and my husband. Sin. Hmm? Even before that, some people got together, contrary to God's will, decided to build a city and a tower and have their own system of worship. And God had to mess that up. They got so bad, God sent a flood. Saved only eight people. Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their three wives. Eight. They came out of the ark. Out of them came the people who built the Tower of Babel. Are you following me? And the world kept getting worse. God cursed the earth when Adam sinned. He cursed the earth when Cain killed Abel. He cursed the earth with a flood. The earth was under a triple curse. Why? Because people sinned. Not God. But God had a plan. You see, God is never caught by surprise. We are, not God. He had a plan. That Christ would come and die. Let's look at the reasons why Christ said he came. Let's go to John chapter 3. Our subject, life before the pandemic. John chapter 3, we read 16 and 17. I am reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Do you have John 3.16? You really shouldn't have to look for that verse, but I'll let you look. John 3, verse 16, and we read 17. Read with me if you have my version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now listen to 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, come on, why did Jesus come? That he might save the whole world. Let's go to John 6. Why did Christ come? John 6. By the way, the whole world includes your enemies. So pray for them. Do you have John 6? Verse 38 and verse 39. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him, finish the verse, which have sent to me. Jesus said, I came to do what the Father sent me to do. I think I told you sometime in my previous presentations, all the nice things Jesus did, the Father told him to do them. There are some people who believe Jesus is nice and the Father is harsh. Listen to me carefully. The Bible teaches all the miracles Jesus performed, all the good works he did, the Father told him to do it because the Father loves us. And so John 6, 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him which have sent me. And this is the Father's will which have sent me, that of all which he have given me, I should lose what? Nothing. The Father's will is that no one in Petersburg be lost. No one in Virginia or Richmond or whatever other towns you have in this area. No one in the United States, in the Western Hemisphere, on the earth should be. That's his will. Of course, we know he won't get his wish, but that's his will. Let's look at the reason why Jesus came again. John 10. Let's read verse 16. Verse 10, sorry. John 10, verse 10, our subject, life before the pandemic. Do you have John 10, 10? Read with me. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Keep reading. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, let's read that verse again, this time microscopically. Think. Jesus is saying effectively, there is something you don't have and I came to give it. And what's that? What kind of life? An abundant life, yes. If he's come to bring it, we don't have it. Ah, I lost you. Are you with me? He came to bring what we didn't have. Now, he came to people who were rich in big houses, no sin in that, nice chariots. Are you following me? 
camels with two humps. He came to people like that, but they did not have abundant life. Which means a life without God is not an abundant life. In the eyes of God. Listen again. The thief cometh not, but for the steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now the thief is the devil. I am come, says Jesus, that they might have life. Because they don't have it. You know, the Bible says a person who lives for pleasure is dead, even while that person lives. 1 Timothy 5, 6. She that liveth in pleasure, she or he is dead, even while the person is physically alive. And so Christ said, I came that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Why else did Jesus come? Go to Matthew chapter 10. We put all of these things together. Matthew chapter 10, we read verse 34. It's a very disturbing verse. And we don't want to misinterpret that verse. Do you have Matthew 10, verse 34? Let me pray again. Father in heaven, as we continue with the message, life before the pandemic, speak very clearly through me, God, and grant me that humility to listen to your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What does verse 34 say? Read if you have my version. Think not that I am come. What? To bring peace on earth. Keep reading. I came not to bring peace but a sword. Stop. What does Jesus mean? Well, he explains. Next verse. For I am come to do what? Set a man at variance. Come on, read it. Against his father and the? Against her? Yes. What is Jesus saying? The message I preach may divide families. Because some will accept it, and some won't. When I was a little boy, there was a lady in my church who loved me. And I'd go to her house every Thursday for dinner. She was godly, godly. And she told me, when she decided to give her life to Christ, she became a Seventh-day Adventist. And her husband didn't like it at all. But she'd go to church every Saturday, which is the Sabbath faithfully went tonight for prayer meeting and her husband got sick to death of it and one Sabbath morning she was preparing to leave for church and her husband pulled out a gun and she told me and pointed the gun at her said you're not leaving this house to go to church she told me she walked up to him you see until you lose the fear of death you really can't give your life to God are you following me once you lose the fear of death the devil cannot intimidate you that's why with all our modern military technology, the United States cannot stop a suicide bomber. Are you with me? She walked up to him. She said, the gun was about right there. She said, I am going to worship my God on his day. It's up to you to decide to pull that trigger or not. And she turned around, picked up her handbag, went to church. When she came back, he was gone. Left, never came back. I am come not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, Christ is the Prince of Peace, but he's saying the gospel message will divide. A child may accept it. I was preaching in a country which shall go unnamed. This young lady came to me, 16 years old. She was a Muslim. So were her family members. But she was convicted by what she heard. Lovely young lady, about 16 years old. She came to me, she said, I have heard what you've said night after night. I am getting baptized. No matter what risk it puts me at with my parents, I am getting baptized. The message put her at variance with her family, and she got baptized. In another series I did in that same country, uh, the year later, a young lady wanted to be baptized. She told her parents. The parents said, if you get baptized, I will strike you out of the will. We will not fund your education. We will give you nothing. She said with all the respect she could amass. She said, Mama, Mom, Dad, I love you. You're my parents. I respect you. But there is a God. 
and I accept what you've said to strike me out of your will, to give me no money, no tuition, no nothing. I accept it, but I have to get baptized. Amen. And she got baptized. Amen. The parents watch her for a year, watching her. When they realized the seriousness of her decision, they restored everything to her. Somebody say amen. amen. Christ said, I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. What he's simply saying is the gospel message will divide some. And so why did Christ come? Not to condemn. Let me stay on that for a while. If you caught up smoking, Jesus does not condemn you. I didn't say he likes smoking. I said he doesn't condemn you. That's not why he came. Now, when he comes a second time, all this non-condemnation ends. He's coming as a judge. But right now, as Jesus watches you with that cigarette in your mouth, he does not condemn you. He's trying to reach you. And you don't need to get rid of the cigarette to come to him. He tells you, come with the cigarette. Just come. Come with the alcohol in your back pocket. Come with the condoms in your wallet. Come. And let me get that cigarette out of your mouth. Let me change the way you think. Just come. Don't improve yourself before you come. Come. Come with that pornograph pornographic website. Come. Why did I give the title Life Before the Pandemic? We've all heard the word the gospel. Hmm? In the Greek, euangelion, which means you is good, angelion is message. That's what the Greek for angel, angel or message, good. So good message is the gospel. We see the word good, you in. A eulogy is a good word over a dead person. Are you following me? A euphemism is a good word used to say something ugly. So you don't die, you just pass away. That's a euphemism. All right. You, you all, uh, the gospel, euangelion, good news. What's the good news? Let me summarize the gospel for us. The purpose of the gospel, listen to me carefully, is to take everything back to the way it was before sin. Restoration. But some of you didn't hear me. You were busy thinking, so let me say it again. <laughs> the purpose of the gospel is to take everything back to the way it was before sin, before floods, before divorce, before conflict between mother and child, before police brutality, before racial unrest, before sickness, before wars, before prisons, before mental institutions, before drug rehabilitation programs, before gun violence, before whatever, God wants to take things back to the way they were. But we are so accustomed to a world of sin it is difficult for us to think that there was a time when there was no sin. Even for Christians. Jesus came to do what was necessary in order that steps may be put in place to restore the world and us to the way things were before there was sin. In other words, the gospel is to bring back life before the pandemic of sin. Are you following me? If you think COVID-19 is a problem, you think of sin. The purpose of the gospel is to restore. The restoration begins not with the restoration of the world. The world was perfect. It will be made again. We know from Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We know that this world will be made all over again. But before God does that, he makes us all over again. And so the first step, if I can say it like that, is the restoration of people back to the image of God. Only God can do that. You can't restore yourself to the image of God. Now, you can be decent. You can be law-abiding. You've never gotten a ticket in your life. But in order to reach that state where you are fit for a place in God's brand new world, only Christ can do that for you and for me. And so Jesus came to restore. Let me tell you a little of what it was like before sin. No one was supposed to die. We're so accustomed to death. It's all around us. Roadkill in Michigan. 
Everywhere you drive, there's a dead raccoon, a dead possum, a dead deer, a dead something. Mm -hmm. A dead red-tailed hawk. All along the road, road I was in Botswana uh, two years ago, and uh, they have a lot of cows in Botswana. I've never seen so many dead cows in all my life. Every mile and a half, there's a dead carcass on the side of the road, you know, because it's a lot of cows, a lot of big ranches, and I guess the offenses are not that many. Dead cow, dead cow, dead cow, dead cow. Before sin, there was supposed to be no death. Before sin, Adam and Eve can talk to God. How? Face to face. Not now. You can't see God now. If you were to see God, finish my words, you die or I. Christ came to make it possible for us to speak face to face with God, to see God. I have seen President Trump on the television. I have seen President Biden. I saw Obama. I saw Bush. I saw the, the other Bush. I saw Clinton. I've never seen them face to face. I've seen Michael Jordan on television. Never seen him face to face. I've seen Neymar on television. Never seen him face to face. We've heard about God in the Bible. We've never seen him face to face. Jesus came to arrange for us to get back to the condition it was when Adam and Eve spoke to God face to face. What is it that ruined this face to face communication? Go to Isaiah 59. Our subject, life before the pandemic, it is now almost a quarter to seven. And I promise to release you by seven o'clock. Isaiah 59, we read verses 1 and 2. I told you last night, I believe it was, Isaiah is called the gospel prophet. In that Old Testament book, he speaks so much about Jesus. Prophetic statements about Christ, all of which Christ fulfilled. Isaiah 59, reading from verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot what? Save, keep reading. Neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. The Bible says the barrier between us and God is sin. Christ came to take that. That through him we might fellowship with God. Let me say it again. Christ came and took the blame for our sins. Now, we hate to take the blame for things we didn't do. Are you, we hate that. Our, our instinctive response is, I didn't do it, even when we've done it. We hate taking blame for things we have not done. Jesus Christ came, he took the blame for murder, adultery, fornication, stealing, war, overeating, whatever you name it. He took the blame for all of that. So that the blame will not have to fall on you if you accept him. But even though Christ did that, we still cannot see God face to face. Are you following me? You, because Moses wanted to see God. God said no. And Moses was God. And no one got closer to God than Moses. And God said, you can't see my face. Because Moses still had a carnal nature. A saved person still has the carnal nature, but is led by the Spirit. Let me say that again. A saved person still has the carnal nature, but is led by the Spirit. So even though you and I are saved by the grace of God, we are not yet in a state where we can literally see God face to face. Christ came to provide the way for all of that to change. And so Jesus came. People accepted him. And their lives were transformed. One of them, Paul. He went from a murderer to a preacher. Zacchaeus, from a thief to someone who repaid people above and beyond what he was required to do. But they still could not see God. Which means that Christ has to do something else because the work of salvation is not yet completely done. Jesus said in John 14, go there with me. Our subject, life before the pandemic. John 14, let's read verses 1 to 3. Very familiar passage. You should say it without looking. John 14, 1 to 3. Do you have that? Listen carefully. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are, but let me pause on that. There are some churches that do not believe that Jesus is fully God. That verse says, if you believe in God as a Savior, you have to believe in me. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I wonder what those mansions look like. Now listen to Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now all of that is future. I want you to observe two things. It's future and it's intimate. Listen again. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Are you with me? You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So it's you and me, you and me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be there also. Do you see? It's Jesus and I. Jesus and I. Jesus and you. But he says, I want you where I am. Because right now, you and I are not where Jesus is, even though we're saved. Are you sure you're following me? Hmm. Being saved from sin is absolutely essential. Being in the very presence of God is something else. We are not yet in the literal brightness of the presence of God. That's the way it was before the pandemic of sin. Adam and Eve looked right at God. Mm -hmm. And nothing happened to them. Have you ever been told as a child, don't stare at the sun? What will happen to your eyes? Your eyes will be damaged. You can't take it. Your eyes were not built to look at the sun. So we have dark glasses. We see through a veil. Jesus is our dark glass to see God. And we still see him by faith. The time is coming because of the gospel where you and I will look right into the face of God. And so Revelation 22 verse 4 says, And his, they shall see his face. That's the way it was before the pandemic of sin. Jesus came to make it possible for life to return to the way it was before sin. There were no members backbiting each other. There were no people fighting for church office. There were no stingy people. There were no greedy people who couldn't care less who went starving as long as they were overfed. No such thing. Christ will bring that back. Life before the pandemic of sin. And he's coming to take us away with him, literally. A few years ago, several people died. They killed themselves because they believed a spaceship was coming for them. Do you remember that? You don't, you don't, you're too young, all right. A spaceship was coming to pick them up, but they had to be in a dead state, and the spaceship would pick them up. So they all killed themselves. And the spaceship never came. They're in the ground. Christ is coming. Not a spaceship. Jesus Christ is coming to get us. That's why he came. To make it possible for you and for me to go back to the way it was before the pandemic of sin. And of, let me tell you, the only problem God has is sin. It is not single women who cannot find husbands. That's not the problem God has. The problem God has is sin. And not even the church will acknowledge that. Christ didn't come because some people don't have PhDs. Jesus didn't have one. He didn't have a wife either. Had no children. John the Baptist had neither. Yet he was called the greatest who ever lived. Paul didn't have children as far as we know. Daniel had none. Jeremiah had none. Christ came to deliver us from sin. 
And he wants to do that in your individual life. He wants to create a, a heart in you that fits you and me to live in the very presence of God. Amen. Do you know how much protocol you have to go through to get into the presence of the Queen of England? And do you know how you have to behave? A few years ago, there's an actress called Angelina Jolie. She had to meet the queen to receive her award. You know how these women dress, you know. <laughs> but she had a long dress all the way down here. You can't wear pants in, in front of the queen. Long dress. No, not, nothing exposed here. Covered. Protocol. Why? She was coming into the presence of the queen of England who has been sitting on that throne since 1952. Every government has an office that handles protocol. This is how you come into the presence of the President of the United States. He sits first, then you sit. He stands first, then you stand. When you go to see the Queen, she has to speak to you first. And don't touch her. <laughs> don't touch her unless she extends a hand. Now we're talking about God. And Jesus said, if you accept me, I will usher you right into the presence of my Father. You can touch him. You can talk to him. He doesn't have to talk first. You can fellowship. My brothers and sisters, this is God's offer to you and to me. A life free from the slavery of sin. And Christ offers it to us tonight. Simple. What does the Bible say? Whosoever believeth in him. You look at that man on that cross and coming out of the tomb. Do you believe he can save me? The answer is yes. The Bible says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe Christ can give you victory over alcohol? Yes. Do you believe he can deliver you from drug addiction? Yes. Do you believe he can deliver you from whatever? The answer is yes. And by the way, this is what is meant by the faith of Jesus in Revelation 14, 12. We know what the commandments are. The faith of Jesus is the ability of Jesus to save someone. A young man wrote me. He's caught up in pornography. Several write me on that point. And he wants to stop. When the devil comes at you through that avenue, he's coming through a strong avenue. Because God gave us sexual urges and he gave us appetite. So he comes through food or he comes through sex. When he gets you in one of those two areas, ah. But he wants to stop. So now he cries. And I have to remind him, it may not happen overnight. But Jesus Christ has promised to save us to the uttermost. He can get you out if you stay with him. Because there's no sin that Christ cannot conquer. Calvary conquers all sins. Young lady wrote me. She has the same problem. She was in therapy. And I did not tell her cancel therapy. No, Christ can work through therapists. But I reassured her, if you follow your program, Jesus Christ can deliver you. And take you back to the way it was before the pandemic of sin. Aren't you tired of sickness? Aren't you tired of war? Of course, the United States, there are no bombs going off, but there are people around the world, that's all they hear. Aren't you tired of conflicts? Just read this today, a little 13-year-old boy got shot in Chicago, 13 by the police. Aren't we tired? of bills, taxes, sickness, flunking exams. Are we tired? There's a world coming where none of that will exist. And Christ wants you in it. It is as literal as the homes we're going to tonight. It is coming as surely as Tuesday is tomorrow. And all the Bible tells us to do, accept Jesus, with all of this. And if you do, your life will change. And Christ, as long as you stay with him, he will prepare you to live in that new world the way it was before the pandemic of sin. My appeal to you, give your life to Christ. Amen. Giving your life to Christ is not an appeal to come to church. 
That's for Christ to put on your heart to do that. Giving your life to Christ is simply saying, Jesus, here's my life. Come, direct me. I'm 90 years old, I'm 17. Come, direct my life. You give it to him and watch what he does. Then he guides you to church. Then he gives you strength to stop that. He gives you strength to stop that. He gives you strength to do that. You give the life to Jesus. And you ask me, how do I do that? You just say it. The same way you give your life to your, you know, we give lives to men, women. I gave my life to my girlfriend. Give your life to your wife. You, you, you give that life to Jesus. And you tell him, direct you. And every day, that's the first thing you do. Father, direct me through Christ. Give it to him. And if you said, I've given it to him, give it again. Because you had food yesterday. Are you following me? Did you want some today? Yes. Give it to him again. And let Christ guide your life. Simple appeal. How many will say from the heart, Father, come, direct my life. Can I see your right hand? Uh, do you mean it? Say yes or no. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. Two minutes to seven. Question for you. There's someone who has a spiritual struggle. Only God knows you have it. No one else knows. And perhaps no one else should know. You have a spiritual struggle. It may be, I do not return a tithe. I secretly smoke. I secretly drink alcohol. I'm caught up in this nasty habit or that. There is, a, but you love God. Don't misunderstand me. You love God and you cry over that condition. And you want to put that at the feet of Jesus tonight. I don't want any hands raised. Make that decision in your heart right where you stand. Father, I am placing that weakness at the foot of the cross. And as Peter was sinking and he cried, Lord, save me. Say that prayer in your heart. And let Christ deliver you. Because that's his specialty. He delivers people. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, our problem is sin. Your problem with us is sin. Christ came to die because of sin. Father, because we, we came from Adam, the original sinner, we have a natural love for sin. That's why we have to be born again and come into the world spiritually with a natural love for righteousness and what's right. Through Calvary Day, God, this is possible. Father, we're tired of this world of sin, suffering, plague, hardship, agony, misery, poverty, theft, interpersonal conflicts. We're tired. Open our eyes, dear God, to see and to believe and to understand and to accept there is a world coming where things will be the way they were before the pandemic of sin. Father, put into our hearts a desire for this life. Put it in us, dear Father, because we do not <clears throat> naturally desire it. Your sons, your daughters have stood to say, we give our lives to Jesus who died for us. Some have said quietly, I have a spiritual weakness I've been caught up in for years. And I'm placing it at the foot of the cross. Dear God, deliver your children from this burden. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Please do that, Father. And as we leave, let us leave with a consciousness, there's a God who loves us and who wants to save us. And who wishes we would stop fighting him. Bless our guests who came in a very special way, Father. Bring them back. Bless their families. Take us home safely. Bring us back tomorrow, dear God, to hear your word again. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen.
as you can. For our closing song, uh, we'll sing hymn number 213. Two, one, three. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. Before I pray, some of you have been here since Sabbath. You were the Sabbath morning program, the Sabbath evening, yesterday and tonight. If the Spirit is convicting you to make a decision that will take you as far as baptism, be sure to let us know that, the pastor, myself, the elder, let us know. We don't make calls for certain reasons, but let us know. If you feel that conviction, however slight it might be, act on it. Let us know so that you and we together can do what needs to be done. Please remember that. And I also speak to those online. If you have that conviction, act on it because convictions wear away quite quickly and the devil would love to do that. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word. We thank you for your people whom you love who came and listened. Father, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice resisting the appeal of Christ, work on that person, dear God until he or she comes to the foot of the cross because that person will be glad that he or she made that decision. As we travel, Father, protect us from harm and danger. Most accidents happen close to home, Father. So take us safely. Let the, put an angel in every car and let that angel protect every home. Bring us back tomorrow to hear your word again. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good night, everyone. Listen to these words. Our High Calling, page 116, paragraph 2, I believe it is. Your last thought at night, your first thought in the morning, should be of him in whom is centered your hope of eternal life. So go to sleep tonight with the thought of Jesus on your mind. Amen.